All right, welcome. Uh, welcome to my session. Uh, we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna wait for two minutes, I think. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I also created a small poll. Um, please give it a try and answer the question. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, welcome to my session. We're gonna be talking today about remote and language agnostic API using gRPC and NI LabVIEW. Okay, um, <clears throat> I created a poll. Uh, you can also um, vote. Have you ever heard about this word gRPC and what that mean? You can answer in the polls section. I would be really interesting to know. Uh, you can do this and uh, let's get started. And of course, we start with our giants are female. Uh, today, I want to, talk, to talk, uh, tell you about Katerina Yushenka. She was a Ukrainian computer information research scientist. She um, was the first woman in the USSR to become doctor of physical and mathematical sciences in programming. And actually, she developed one of the world's first high-level languages called address programming language. This is the, uh, the cover book. And this book mm, is really important. Why? Because uh, this language, address programming language, was the first book that was kind of describing the idea of addresses and second rank addresses. And actually, they are pointers that we know and use everywhere. Even in LabVIEW, we have uh, data value references. This is just pointers. And um, also, she was uh, the founder of the first Soviet school of theoretical programming. Sadly, uh, and this is uh, this is a story. Uh, she wrote the book in 1955 and uh, explicitly, like mathematically, explained the idea of these pointers that we use in programming languages. However, it was not it was unknown outside of the Soviet Union. And actually, if you go, go to Wikipedia or like, it's a common well-known fact that Harold Lawson was, uh, that is credited for the invention that happened later. So yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud that uh, Katerina Yushinka made uh, this um, good and huge theoretical work in that day, so it was not easy. And uh, so yeah, as you can see, our giants are female. Now let's, um, slightly changed the topic since uh, we're here about talking our our small and lab view uh, applicable applications. Let's talk about our favorite customers. And we will start with the prep problem statement. Imagine that we have our favorite customer and he or she asked us to build a remote API for the software that we have uh, written in LabVIEW. And uh, on top of that, the customer wants to have some kind of functions that he can or she can call through like remotely also stream data. And the API should be compatible with C-sharp, Python, Java, and LabVIEW. Well, good. And it should be extensible in the future, okay? And probably we also need to add um, C++ and web support in the future. So it seems like it's like a, it's like a huge task. And uh, yeah, normally we say, wow, um, and I was kind of thinking, okay, what can we, what can we, how can we address this? And gRPC is the answer. Um, you can take it for granted. Uh, we will go and take a look how it works. And then let's see at the end of the presentation if this is the solution to the problem. But first, what is gRPC? Um, gRPC is a popular open source RPC framework supported by Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a nonprofit foundation for uh, different activities. It's cross-platform. This is really cool because it can run both on Windows and Linux machines and whatever you can compile uh, the protocol to. It supports 11 major programming languages, including C Sharp, Python, Go, Java, and many more. And since it's Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, program, it also supports web, right? LabVIEW is not a one of these 11 officially major programming languages that are supported, but more on that later because we're here to, to talk about LabVIEW and gRPC. 
one cool thing about this technology is contract first. I really personally like this idea. This means that first you define what are the functions you want to transmit and the data types and everything, and only then you start implementing. You always have a contract in between. I'm going to show this in a second. And it uses modern technologies, HTTP2 and Protobuf. One first one is for sending the data efficiently between computers. It runs on over TCP IP, it's HTTP, it's it's new web standards, de facto standard now. And protobuf is the way how you can serialize your data. You know, in LabVIEW we have flatten and unflatten from a string. Protobuf is quite the same analogy. It's a binary serialization stuff. Together, you have a gRPC. Okay, now let's talk uh, about how this wall works. We have a server on the right, we have a few clients on the left, and uh, remote procedure call frameworks works in the same way. You have a request and then you have a response. They all run on over HTTP2. You don't have to worry about this, it's just a really modern protocol with security, authentication, and everything that you will find everywhere in, in internet. And Protobuf will be the engine that will serialize and deserialize data. But how do we get there? Well, it all starts with the protofile. Protofile is, a, is a just a file. And based on that, this is a contract actually, you automatically generate service for the, for the server, kind of DLLs if it's a C++, or maybe you can uh, generate just uh, classes or Python scripts and for the clients. And this is like your foundation. This is where it starts from. Then uh, let's talk about uh, positive and negative things about this technology. So of course, HTTP2 is really, is really cool and it enables multiplexing. Uh, this means that your data can be uh, transmitted through diff diff different technologies like uh, multiplexing then in one uh, connection or maybe multiple connections up to, I don't know, a lot, it will be optimized. And it allows advanced in streaming, more on that later. But of course, it's, it's not supported everywhere. We're in the still like uh, in a transition phase. But our platforms are touch supported. High performance, so protobuf is small and fast, but it's not human readable. Okay, for us, LabVIEW people, it's maybe not so problematic, but if you look at the internet, JSON is everywhere, and JSON is a, is a text, right? A protobuf is not a text, but the same idea. And protofile and the concept like how you build a server and the clients, this is of course a productivity boost. You have a file and then you automatically get your server and the client. That's great. But of course, many people say, okay, I don't like this. Uh, I need some tooling. I need this contract and so on. Uh, so I hope you're, you're with me on this. Uh, it's not so complicated so far. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I'm gonna go further. Now let's talk about this contract, how, how you define your contract, how you define your functions. Well, for that, you need to just create a protofile that looks like this. Well, first line is like a syntax definition. And then, yeah, it's defined the contract and uh, it's used to auto-generate the code. Let's take a moment to look at how it, it's built up. First, you have a service. This is just a keyword. And then you can put anything here, like, I don't know, LabVIEW application server whatsoever. And then here you have keyword RPC, stands for the function. Basically you say, I have a function that is called measure. It takes e units as an input and returns something that is temperature. Though they're like, you can see it's clusters in LabVIEW basically. And units in turns like out that it, it is integer 32 bit and it's only one data field there, it's unit. You can just, uh, one is just a sequential number. Um, it will be always like one through three, four until the end. So it's very simple. And you can see temperature cluster or structure is just a double that the temperature. So basically I have a protofile that has only one method measure. It takes units as an input and returns temperature as an output. Quite simple. Okay. Yeah, and as I said, uh, protocol buffers are responsible for serializing and deserializing data. 
So um, let's talk about types of RPC that are supported. We all know that you know you can communicate with the, like computers can communicate with each other using different technologies and or like communication mechanisms. And the simplest is one request, one response. I want you to do this. Okay, I'm done. Or give me this data. This is your data. There is another um, type that is supported, and this is very critical for LabVIEW, is one request and end responses. This is a server streaming. You can say, hey, I want you to stream the data. Okay, this is your stream, and server just streams the data, and then it can go infinitely in real time. There's another uh, way of doing this when the client is streaming. It's also cool when we when we build some kind of application in LabVIEW that needs to consume the data from the client and put it to the instrument. Very, very handy. And there is even bidirectional streaming. And this is all supported by gRPC, which sounds really cool. Um, but, <laughs> but why should Lab, LabVIEW folks care? I mean, OK, gRPC, it's cloud stuff. Folks with microservices does a lot of things but we are doing like instrumentation where do we do other things why why do we should why should we care well the answer is as i can see is because api and especially remote in api is a is really important element of our work and why well we levy community we always or often create client server apps because we have i don't know compact rios uh pxi on linux real time or just modules running on the same computer uh, for inter interprocessor communication, um, and since we build this, we therefore create a lot of communication protocols. We use TCP/IP or UDP, like a basic stuff, uh, flash, and and, and uh, it's it's just uh, just you know stuff that you always do. Or you can take SDM, or you can take actor network endpoints, or you can do whatever you want, right? You can use JSON, you can use uh, even Web. Web Web also works nice. But we always do this, right? And uh, once we've done it, we need to maintain it. We need to document, we need to test it, we need to update. We need to explain also other engineers, how do I call your server? How do I use your API? And yes, uh, this the sad truth is that LabVIEW is not the only language in the world. So we have a lot of teams that don't understand LabVIEW. And um, yeah, we need to care about this as well. So we need to use the data types that are compatible. Um, I once I tried to um, de like uh, re-implement unflatten from string in in other programming language. It was quite difficult because because you need to really see how it is backed on the binary format. So let's uh, jump. Um, okay, so um, sounds like. I, I convinced myself that gRPC, maybe you as well, that gRPC kind of relevant to, to LabVIEW. But then the question is, the LabVIEW is not in the list of this 11 languages. Is it available in LabVIEW right now? And the answer is, well, kind of. Well, I would say it is available and it will be more and more coming. So the the the, the most time that we spend together, we will be doing and building applications today with the gRPC. But first, let me give you an overview of what we have today in, in LabVIEW world. So tools available as of today are the following. First, we have a repository um, hosted at an I uh, GitHub account. I'm going to bring this here. Um, this is a repository. Um, and uh, there is documentation. As you can see here, we have a list of contributors. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of C++ and LabVIEW and other things. So it's open source and MIT license. Um, it's not yet completed. It's um, under development. And, uh, but we have already released 0 0.040 which means that everything can change and it will probably change because uh, now we're working on LabVIEW part. And uh, this release includes VI package manager, like packages that you can install. You have here the library itself and the templates. And this release is supported on Windows 32 and 64 bit, as well as Linux, as well as Linux real time, which is really cool. And, um, in two hours today, there will be a presentation of the maintainer of this repository, 
uh, Christopher Tsifra at 6 p.m. at Europe time. And please don't miss it because uh, we kind of split it, um, the topic. So he will cover more like a technology stuff, how it's done and how to contribute to the repository. And he will be also talking about gRPC device, a project from a night, it's another topic completely out of this, but uses gRPC. We are now going to jump into LabVIEW and let's build the first app. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, I hope that my demo will work today. Um, and um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna build a remote temperature measurement device. Well, it's very simple. You can get a temperature by command, like saying, hey, hey, what is the temperature? Temperature this and this, right? And uh, we can also request the temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit. And uh, yeah, let's do the demo. So everything starts with creating a proto file, right? Because proto file defines the contract. And um, I already kind of have the proto file, so I don't want to type it with you, but I will quickly show you the definition, okay? So um, I'm gonna go to this file and open it so we can see together how it looks like. First, as you saw, it's a syntax proto, and we define a service that called temperature service. It has one method, RPC measure, and measure takes units. Um, this is a number and returns the temperature. My idea is to use here uh, zero uh, for Celsius. Uh, okay, I'm bad at typing this word, latent. But yeah, uh, Celsius and, and uh, um, one is for Fahrenheit. Later, we will change this to enums, but for now, just for, for, for ease of understanding, we'll use number. Don't, don't get confused by this because this is just a serial number. If you want to add string, that's not a problem. You type string here, uh, I don't know, comment, and uh, put it like two. And they all will grow like one, two, three, and until the end, uh, like a, this is a key basically. Okay, now we have a proto file, one function, units as an input, returns to temperature. Now let's go and generate some, some code. For that, first of all, I have um, gRPC libraries installed. I have them uh, like a library and a template. Once I have it, I get here um, gRPC tool. I'm gonna start that. It's um, it's just a VI, there's a wizard that will parse this file and create a client and a server. Basically, you can select here what you want to create. We start with the server. Um, first step, I need to select um, the proto file. I'm gonna select the proto file. The next thing that I want to do is select the, the target project where I want to, my files to be placed. I'm gonna select this project. It's uh, an empty project at the moment. Target name, this is a field. If you have a compact trio, you should uh, type the compact trio, this, like a, how it's called in your project. Then here, I'm gonna put like just X1 for the library name and uh, I want to create a server. Okay, this will take uh, some time um, because um, yeah, my laptop is not like the modern one, um, but while this is happening, I also want to show you uh, one thing is, uh, so now we created a server, but we also want to have a client, like how do we test it once we are done? For that, we have a free tool that is called Bloom RPC. And how this works is um, you kind of add, um, add a proto file. Uh, for example, one, yes. And it parses this proto file and say, okay, this is my temperature server and this is my method measure. And this is my like a request uh, parameter. I'm gonna prepare that because um, yeah, I think my wizard is ready. Hope so, not yet. Um, maybe I can take a look into the polls. Okay, show results, okay. Yeah, we have some results actually. 30% um, of the 
of the of the audience have heard about gRPC, but most of of the uh, of the participants have not heard about this, which is good. That's why we're doing here um, this uh, kind of introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so Bloom RPC. Thank you. Uh, this is good, good, good stuff. Um, I hope we are gonna finish this. It's all under under work now. It's all uh, a little bit open source, um, but it works. Uh, let me scroll. Oh, okay. We we've done. Okay, so let's let's take a moment and see what we have become from from our scripting utility. Actually, we got a lot a lot of VIs already, um, and uh, it's actually a VI that we can already start. This is the main VI, the main server, and uh, we can uh, take a look inside and see what's happening inside. Okay, first we have a creation of the server. Um, this takes server address and certificate uh, files if we want to use encryption. We will not do this with this example, but this is possible. Then this is a, if you want to have like a use a state data or you want to use the framework to like not only manage your communication, but also kind of uh, take care about the objects that you manipulate, you can use this structure. Um, then you start the server and uh, here it's actually the working code. You have two, two ways how you can create it. One is a synchronous server or synchronous implementation. We're gonna start with synchronous. I'm gonna remove that uh, and I'm gonna remove that. And then you can go inside. Now it's time to add, add the code. So here is just a, just a framework and let's add user event. And you can see here, actually this is our RPC method called measure because this name was taken from from the proto file, we're gonna add it here. And yeah, strangely, we don't have any data types here. So we have kind of an ID. So yes, this is how it works. We need to also go to RPC methods, find our method, go to messaging, and then we have two, two VIs. They kind of provide us with the payload. So here with the get input, I have my parameters that are my input parameters. They're basically unit. If you remember, we had that in in our proto file. This is this is it. This is a type def created by for us. This is the input parameter. And when I'm here, it's time to do some useful task. And here I need to send the output. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do it very simple, like random number, and we can add um, 25 degrees of Celsius. So we're not gonna build a complete application today. I beg your pardon for that, but it will be too much. Um, yeah, so we need to also bundle this and uh, let's see, this is um, this is also all type def, which is good. And uh, let's send it temperature. As you can see, all the names are, they are, they came from from the proto file. Okay, um, I'm done. Now uh, let's see how, how this work works. Uh, I'm gonna run it. So this is my address. Uh, this is my Bloom RPC free tool. This is it, this is it, let's run it. Okay, I have my temperature back. I can also do this many times uh, to see how this reacts. Well, this was, um, this was not so complicated, was it? I hope I hope you were able to and to follow along. Um, let's let's jump to another um, scenario, and maybe this time we are gonna. Yeah, may, you know what? Let's do let's do a client. Or if I have it, uh, I can just show you. Um, X one client. Let's see. Oh, okay, it's already empty. So uh, let's create it. So I'm gonna go to the same VI that I was using for creating my server. This time I'm gonna select another project, which should be empty. And uh, I'm gonna create this project then. Okay, here I select another template, which is client. Let's see how it works. 
Uh, let's take a look into the questions. Um, yeah, isn't uh, isn't pay, uh, Cyril asks isn't painful to have to define the data exchange in separate files? If you want to something modular, extensible, then you have to update several layers. Yes, um, I can definitely understand your uh, your concern, and um, you can actually it it is it is not so painful um, because to, when I if you ask me because if you work into in, in like if your software is not for your for your teammate or for or maybe if if the software passes the boundaries of your team then this is a kind of a contract that you know separate responsibility so y you know that the framework will be calling your methods and your payload will be correctly serialized and deserialized so you kind of you don't look for for the errors inside of your communication modules or something like this and um, and it's in its uh, lang language agnostic so uh, I will be showing also other programming languages like a Python and C sharp that interacts with with this so I see this technology more suitable for LabVIEW server talking to other languages or LabVIEW client talking to other languages for talking LabVIEW to talk to LabVIEW maybe it's easier to take something that we already have um, yeah, okay, we have a client. Let's take a look what we have from the from the scripting utility. It's one class, and here in the client API, we have create, destroy, and the method. Very simple. And uh, we also have a small VI, which is called client test. It's just uh, like a create and D in it, and you can put your, uh, your method inside. Uh, let's do this. Um, let's wire this up. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not interested in providing any kind of uh, input. Well, let's make sure that we have a server running. And now let's run it. Okay. So we see that we have some data, and uh, yeah, I'm happy with this result. It was re really easy. Okay. Um, so now we take a look. We have uh, come to this kind of small demo of like remote temperature measurement device. Let's go further. Um, we kind of now want to build more advanced application is kind of remote temperature controller device where we not only just measure, but we also want to set the set point, right? So you want to enable and disable the controller, want to put a set point and want to also measure temperature. And we also have to create a nice client and lab view. And also let's do a C-sharp stuff, why not? Okay. So for that demo, I will not be creating this for, for, for from, from scratch because it will be too much time. Uh, I want to also ask your, uh, or like answer your questions. So um, let's open something that like, uh, like I prepared, uh, don't save. My favorite button, don't save um, EX2. Okay, let's take a look at the proto file first. I use this Visual Studio code because it has the syntax highlight um, let's go to X2 and see what we have. Let's start with the proto. So this is how it looks like. So here I already start using enums because I realized, okay, maybe enums are good. So again, syntax proto three temperature. This isn't the name of the service or the name of the library, something that I can distinguish. I have two methods. One is measure. It's, it's almost the same and configure. So let's talk about measure. Um, it takes measure request as an input. It, and this is temperature unit. What is this? Ah, okay, temperature unit is an enum. So basically you can define enums like this and say Celsius is zero, Fahrenheit is one, and you can put it here as a payload. Um, and um, another cool thing that you can do, you can actually do nested types. For example, if this is controller settings request, this is my type. And uh, I can say, OK, in my measure request, I also want to transmit that. That's not a problem. I'm going to put it like this and say, OK, uh, settings. And this will be the second field. So you can think about this actually as uh, you know, if you go to clusters, reorder controls, it's the same. OK. Um, Right, so we will not do this because this is not gonna work because I have already prepared the demo. But now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you 
some things how how I think we can use uh, this in. Uh, yeah, let me let me first start with a demo, and then we're gonna go and see how it's built. Um, this is my server, and here I have async implementation. This is another way how you can do this. So we have to we take a look at the synchronous implementation where you have remember like one VI and event structures. Here we have a sync. I'm going to show you in a second how this works. Let, but let's let's run it and see how how this works. Let's go also to the client. And uh, let's run the client. Oh, look at this. What a beautiful VI. So um, this, this is a VI. It just transmits you actual temperature. Now I want to select the units. I'm going to go to set point. Uh, like, um, I don't want it to be too hard. Let's put it like, uh, like cool down a little bit emotions, like 18, something like this. Oh, okay, it's demo time. I think my virtual machine is, is, not, is not doing good. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, where is my server? You know what? We need your support on this open source project. What I can tell you. Uh, let's try to abort that and see and see what's happening. Yeah, probably I need to restart start LabVIEW. Of course, it's a pity that demos don't work always. Yeah, okay. Don't always work as expected. Maybe I was too nervous. Maybe it was fine. Maybe it was a glitch. Um, who knows? You know what? Uh, the cool thing about this technology as well is that it's tolerant when it's done properly. It's tolerant to this kind of things that you can lose the server, you can lose the client. There is a lot of technology behind it, how you can re recover this. Um, there is a dead deadline propagations, a lot of things uh, that is in this framework. Uh, we just need to you know, extend it to the way that it works flawlessly in LabVIEW. I'm going to restart the demo. I'm st I still strongly believe that it will work. If not, uh, I have some videos. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, this is uh, this is a good sign. A good sign that LabVIEW died. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, Chris asks a question. Right, Oliver, that's that's a good point. So uh, there will be presentation in two in two uh, in two hours from that. Um, my goal is here to show you the, how you can use it in LabVIEW. And uh, let's do it again. And in other languages. OK. Now we'll listen into that. And I'm going to open the client. Um, client, yeah. So this, this example is pretty simple. And uh, I think I just stressed my, my virtual machine a little bit. Because I'm here, I'm using not a streaming, I'm using a polling. As you can see here, it's like a client creation. And then I have a timeout here, and I'm just asked for for the for the temperature. Hey, what's the actual temperature? Maybe that was the case. Let's see. Okay, I'm up. Uh, let's let's cool down and uh, enable that. Okay, so you see it's kind of a jump back. I can disable it, goes back uh, like uh, back to the 20. So all in all, it, it kind of works. Um, if you want to see it in Fahrenheit, this all works. And by the way, all this is available on GitHub, so you can take a look how this is done. Let's take a moment to see this time what this means when we say I want asynchronous implementation. Actually, if you go inside, it's just two VIs put in parallel. So every method can be executed in parallel. Let's go in this method. This is actually, oops. Uh, a method that is called configure. And this is my implementation of the configure. Let's see here. Yeah, so I take the ID, I use the VI from, from the classes, I take my payload, do something here. This is now a cool part. Uh, this is a, a technique that allows me to kind of have the same data in parallel threads. You can come up with your own implementation. 
this is something that framework provides. This is my controller class that I injected when I started the server. Let me show you that here in a second. So this is the server. I created a, my class and that injected inside. And when I do this, framework creates a data reference to that and, and saves it in the class. It's all kind of already made for you. So when you work in these two methods, this and this, you can always get your, your class that is uh, shared between, between threads by, by this construct. You don't have to. If, if it's ap applicable to your application, you can do this, right? So as you can see here, here I enable the configuration in another method. I do the measurement, I think, uh, in the measure. I do the measurement like this. All right. And let's see how this works with uh, C Sharp stuff. I'm going to run this again. OK. And uh, now this is a .NET application. I'm going to show you this here. Don't, don't, don't be like too. It's it's a lot of text. Don't look at this like a, it's in Snellen world. You don't have to know this. The most important thing here is that when now I am on the team that can do only C sharp stuff, the only thing that I can do or should do is go to my project file and say, prod above include this file. This will automatically invoke code generation when I click compile. And this is really cool. So I don't have to implement all these methods by myself. As you can see here, for example, the method that is called measure from client, it's all created. And it takes this measure request. And it's all automatically scripted. Let's run it. I'm going to go and start the terminal. And I have my server running. It's yeah, maybe it's because I made it big. Um, OK, .NET run. .NET run will just compile the project for me, and it will run it. I hope so. Bear with me. Yes, OK, welcome to temperature controller. It asked me to enter the address. Address is the same. I'm going to click. OK, now what I got, I got it measure temperature. Then I set this to 30 degrees Celsius. OK, it's immediately jumped to 30 degrees. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was it. If I now run client from LabVIEW, um, yeah, I think it's because of the out of scale. It's actually, it's actually 30 degrees here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so we can even have this client, right, and, and run in this client. And uh, that was, uh, was easy. So here I use native types. They are not something alien to C Sharp. And this is cool. Now let's accelerate a little bit because we have other examples to show. Um, all right. Um, next one. Uh, this is uh, from Navin. Uh, I think he's uh, in the chat also here. Um, we've been working together on, on this repository a little bit, and uh, this is an example from him. It's um, also a kind of application LabVIEW server with uh, some waveform generation and measurement stuff. It can generate signals by command, change signal parameters, measure signal parameters, and we have client in LabVIEW, client in Python. And let's do the demo quickly. All right, I'm going to stop that. Oh, I think that was a that was a mistake, but I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if this will will work. Oh, it's it's an interesting thing. So you can start already filling the box uh, like a bug report in GitHub, because if you stop the server and this was working, okay, maybe it was not a good good stuff. Okay, yeah, very nice. But at least it's not cheating. You see, that's why I like attending also live events um, because you can see how how sometimes there is no magic. It's all like bits and bytes, and the computer always does what we what we asked uh, him to do. All right. Um, I think I need to kill LabVIEW, and um, we're gonna. Start in the moment. Okay, let's take a look at what protofile first we have. 
Oh, okay. I think it's in this repo. Uh, this is our proto file. Let's take a moment to see. Okay, so you see here, it's more, it's more like um, much more methods. Also, Navin used uh, packaging, which is uh, also kind of way to avoid type conflicts. So if you define the sampling info, like a structure that you can find maybe in different protofiles, you can use packages to kind of add uh, add an additional layer to the namespace to, yeah, just to, to avoid uh, type conflicts. Yeah, I already said that. Okay, so it's kind of huge. Um, you will also get the link uh, to the repo. You can also take a look how it's done. It has, uh, let's start it. Uh, I hope my lab view kind of feel good again. All right. Let's see. Um, let's start it. So first, I'm going to start the server. Um, boom. Now we are running this. And now I'm on to open. Let's go to, I think I need to go here here and the client let's open that and uh, let's open bloom rpc b l o o b l o o okay nice okay um let's run it okay so this this uh, service is a remote service that here we have some kind of a, a signal generation stuff. Um, and yeah, let's do this. Okay, so now we're kind of generating some, some sine wave. I think we can even, uh, we can even change uh, the frequency. Yeah, you can see it's uh, kind of changing. Okay, it's even handles zeros. Cool. Okay, so now we have some, some stuff here. We can also, um, if we don't have any any client, we can also import the proto file. Uh, let's go here. Uh, let's go to Naving proto. Open that. Now we have another service, and we have another parameters. We can uh, apply signal parameters from here. Yeah, or let's apply some noise parameters because I think we will see. Or yeah, just you know, we can even just uh, just generate some signal. Let's see how this works. Only thing that we need to change is this the address. Uh, let's gonna we're gonna copy that from here. Boom. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then let's do this. Okay, now we even get some data in parallel to to our run application. So our samples are here. Now the last thing that we can do is we can run in parallel also Python script because for those who are Python people, it's also really cool, right? I don't know Python, but Navin knows. So why not use this uh, stuff? So here, um, it's also quite straightforward. Here we need to provide the address. These are just parameters and uh, yeah, noise type one. I think we even should see the effect right away here. Let's run it here and we will see the output in the console. And also I think we see it here. Okay, uh, we have some kind of, uh, kind of measurements from that. Um, and uh, let's change the noise type to two and run it again. Okay, as you can see in the background, we changed some parameters. So basically, it all works, right? I think so. Uh, okay, let's stop it. Um, yeah, thank you, Navin. And uh, yeah, uh, by the way, all these links, uh, they are links to the GitHub uh, GitHub repositories with the, all the examples that we, you see here. And let's, let's uh, spend uh, five minutes on, on real cool stuff in the streaming. Streaming is really cool because 
this is not something like we, we need to pull it like, hey, give me the data, give me the data. No, we actually start the streaming and it will be just sending the data. And what we're going to do, we're going to stream 48 kilohertz signal on the server. And uh, let's take a moment to look how this wor works. Uh, OK, I'm going to stop that. OK, let's no, don't save or save. I always confused. Mm, don't save. Um, yes, now and thank you. Um, yeah, OK, so for Python people, this, Tatiana writes an interesting thing is about RPIC uh, toolkit. Yeah, for those guys who are not really, don't, don't like really strict type definitions or like prefer other type of communications, there are a bunch, there are a lot of other RPC frameworks out there. So our gRPC is just one, one implementation. Okay. Um, and let's let's do the last one. And uh, here it's it's a little bit interesting. Uh, let's open the server. I'm going to show you the uh, how you can define a streaming. So example number three, proto file. Let's take a look at the moment how how this looks like. Basically, what I also like in this kind of definition is that you don't have to be a language expert. You see this right and you understand what your server is kind of providing automatically so okay you see okay i have a signal streamer he has a one only one method get data stream as an input is a channel number what is this is just okay some kind of a number and what it returns it returns a waveform it's a levy waveform start time dt and samples and there are a couple of things here to note one this is a keyword stream means that this is a normal like single request and this means multiple responses one another thing is here we have a repeated keyword i can assure there is a lot of documentation that you can you know go and then dive in if you just type here i don't know um proto syntax um it's it's really good old documented. You can take a look how it looks like, how you define a message type, how you how you define enumerations and everything. So, and the good thing is it's again, it's language agnostic. It's not it's not kind of a C sharp or something like this. It's just everyone should learn this and then from that you generate clients and servers. And so repeated means that we will have an array of doubles that is called samples. And uh, yeah, let's take a look how this works. So first, I have my streamer. This is my server. Let's take a look how how I do this. First, I have a async implementation. In this case, it doesn't matter, just one, one VI. And here, this is now a little bit tricky. So when my function is get called, I have this input with my channel. But this is how I found a solution how to do this. So basically, I need to spawn a process, start a process that will stream the data to this ID. I'm going to send this data. I also kind of, kind of a stop notifier. And I'm going to start this VI just asynchronously. This VI will just call this function set output, set output, set output at any pace. So I said, OK, I want to put the data five times per second. You can do it another way. But so basically, what I programmed here is when the function is called, I'm going to start a streamer. And streamer will send the data. Let's see how this works. I'm going to use, uh, first of all, I'm going to use um, Bloom, R uh, Bloom RPC. So now I'm listening to this. I'm going to start this Bloom RPC. I need to add a P uh, proto file for that. So it was uh, example three, proto, signal streamer. And uh, yeah, so signal streamer is here. Signal streamer gets data. So first thing first, I need to provide the address. And uh, actually, here it's it's another it's another um, view here because it's a streaming. So, for example, I'm interested in channel one, right? And let's run it. Okay, it's running. So as you can see here, this is a start time. It's changes and uh, Let's, let's see what's happening on the 
on the server side. So this is my server side. This is my uh, streamer VI that I started. Now I can do the following things. First, I can force, I can stop it like a manual stop. Okay, so now this part now understands, okay, there is no one who transmits it. It was aborted. I can also run it again. Okay, I think I have another, okay, I have another, another, another thread, um, another VI, okay. Now it works. I can actually now say, okay, um, I'm not interested in data. So the client side can say, okay, I'm not interested in that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it. This also kind of, okay, I programmed it in the way that if, if there is an error, we just go out, right? And then you just call this end call. This is an indication that, okay, we, we are not interested in that. Let's do let's do another thing with the C sharp and uh, and then we have some time to to open to 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 answer the questions. So server is running. Um, I think this is it. I'm gonna do the same. .NET run. Uh, this is another project. Again, what I did is um, is just added the proto file to my project and that's it. So I have some uh, some information here. And if I stop it here, it will be stopped. But what I want to do is I can actually do this. I can also run a Bloomy RPC and also start streaming. I hope my computer will manage that. Okay. Okay, I think I clicked twice. Okay, this is really a stress test. As you can see my power, power <laughs> CPU is it's it's not because of gRPC. I, I need to assure you, assure you that it's it's another another issue, but um, it's all kind of works fine. Of course, you have you don't have to show all these windows, but this is really cool. This is I think where gRPC is really like uh, highlights its power. All right, uh, we have uh, eight minutes. Thank you. well. First of all, let me finish the presentation and then uh, we're gonna talk about other things. Okay. First of all, thank you. Um, where to go next? Um, there will be, again, presentation on gRPC. If you find the topic interesting, go there. I will be there. You should go there. Um, then, OK, some some links, gRPC IO, our repository. And also, there is a gRPC ecosystem like with awesome gRPC like highlights, what you can do, and so on. And don't forget to enjoy July Summit. Um, well, yeah, smile and have a good day. Um, now let's maybe talk or like uh, have some Q and A. All right. Um, oh, I see a lot of lot of messages. It's really it's really cool to be on this kind of uh, kind of a, a virtual events. Um, okay, uh, Cyril, we answered that. Yeah. Okay. Navin mentioned that it's not. It's not necessary to define the data in the file always if the data is dynamic. Yeah, there are other things that we can do. Yeah, I I'm not sure if this is gRPC compliant, but um, Louis writes if you want to work with already existing and I hardware gRPC API, you can pick on gRPC device. Correct, Louis. This is good. This is uh, what uh, what uh, Christopher will be talking about as well. So, uh, David, uh, so units and temperature are DTOs, data transfer objects. Yes, you can think of this as a, as a, as a just a transferable objects. Um, yeah, and they are, they have a lot of things um, in behind. You can, when you when your protocol changes, when you add a new function or you change the function, you can mark specific fields as obsolete or you can mark specific fields as optional. And we have not uh, talked about this yet or today, but there is a lot of possibility with, with gRPC. Um, and yeah, okay, okay. Uh, Christopher Stryker, are there currently any tools to script the proto file ba based on Lysen VI Connect? Good stuff. Um, I'm not aware of that. Would be cool. Please participate in open, uh, in open source. Uh, Matthew Harrison, could you address any issue if we want to send a LabVIEW class? I don't think that this will, well, with 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 the proper scripting, I think yeah, everything is possible. I'm not sure that you can do like uh, you can 
yeah, it's a good good point. I don't know. It would be cool though. But when we send like LabVIEW classes, you always need to think about, okay, I'm, I'm building a service for any like language agnostic stuff. So I'm, I'm assuming that we're limited to the common data types found everywhere, like in every programming language. So in this regard, I think you can definitely transfer private data of your class or public data, but not probably not extra stuff that like a, you can you can do this but uh, i think it's not it's not useful in this context um okay andre burman asks what if you update the contract for existing service it's a good point so there are kind of different kinds of updates that can happen you will get an error if everything is mismatched right and the, the, there is a good article on how you can do this. So basically, if you have a proto file and you, comp you have created a, a server and the client, and then you update your proto file, and this updated version is available to the server and to the client, they run this uh, scripting tool. This is like, not for LabVIEW, but other pro programming languages, it's like one second job. And they get, got this, and they will get conflicts uh, or not. And this is like a, like update. But there is also an option to keep the backward compatibility. I think I don't have time to describe this, but maybe Christopher Cifra uh, uh, will talk about this. But this is a good point. Uh, Chris, what do you what do you feel is the major value proposition of gRPC? Well, the, the major stuff, as I can see, it's language agnostic and it's remote and it's a standard. If you want to open up and build your software and, and, and you want to make it compatible with other programming languages, you can use web, web VIs or web sockets, or you can use gRPC. And uh, the cool thing is it's just fast. And it's binary. And for LabVIEW, like data streaming, this is where my interest comes from. I want to be able to stream data efficiently from uh, from a real-time target to the PC. And this is the perfect stuff. Well, LabVIEW flatten to string, send it over TCP IP will be also efficient, but there is no like things like encryption. There is no things like um, authentication. There is no things like uh, supporting different programming languages. And uh, yeah, this is uh, this is major stuff I think here. Um, um, yeah, I think I'm out of time. I'm sorry. There's a lot of a lot of um, well, thank you very much. A lot of applause. I really enjoyed this. I hope you too um, enjoyed the GLA summit and see you in the lobby. Bye-bye.